Hello everyone, today we talk about Basil I, known as the Macedonian Byzantine Emperor between 868 to 886 for our Byzantine history uh, series. As you know, I cover in some detail, at least, you know, every kind of imperial reign and then we make kind of more in-depth, um, further depth, let's say, uh, thematic content. Uh, as well, we talked about the Macedonian dynasty that would last until the 11th century, and you know how important it was, right? Under the so-called Macedonians, uh, the Byzantine Empire recovered much of its um, uh, previously lost power, both in the East and in the West. Basil was uh, the founder of the same, in fact, so-called Macedonian dynasty. We will look at this again his ethnic background, because we call it Macedonian, um, due to the fact that at the time uh, Macedonia was within the theme of Thrace, from which Basil uh, came from. We know something about his family, there was probably an Armeno-Slavonic background uh, from his father's side and a Greek one from his mother's side. However, the exact ethnicity of this dynasty is not completely clear. Um, also because there were voices anyhow that also you know there was not really a biological continuity including with with um, Basil's son allegedly Leo the sixth we, we talked about him uh, recently in a, in a similar video about in fact Leo the sixth uh, the wise uh, reign we talked about him also as far as is in fact historiographical production is concerned as you know as an important um, military uh, source for Byzantine warfare uh, at the time on the base of the re-edited on the base of the Strategicon fundamentally. However, um, we look at this figure that is interesting also in, in back right. Um, he uh, when he came to power, um, the current emperor that he basically took out in a coup was Michael the Third. Right, Michael was assassinated in 867 by the same Basil that fundamentally had become, by that point, Michael's favorite, and or at least he was about to be supplanted by, by another one <laughs> in, the, in the process, and in fact he managed to kill Basil and this other, if I'm not wrong, Basilicos, that was what his name was, um, after a banquet allegedly, right while the two were drunk and kind of um, conscious-less, and he entered the palace and uh, took their lives with uh, with a sword, and consider in fact that Basil had also managed to take out uh, the Caesar Bardas, managing eventually to have himself a recognized co-emperor under Michael, um, and just subsequently he had fallen out of power uh, himself, and and in spite of the say gruesome origin of his reign, Basil I managed to consolidate his power, founding, in fact, uh, the Macedonian dynasty that would remain on, on the, the throne of Constantinople for almost two centuries. And so we call it, for the uh, aforementioned reason, the Macedonian dynasty. Um, Basil had been born around 827 by poor parents uh, living around uh, Adrianople and he owed his fortune by uh, entering first of all at the service of a relative of Michael the third who brought him um, in the in, in the Peloponnese where um, in Patras he became intimate with a, a rich widow um, from whom uh, Daniela, I think she was her name, from um, from whom he obtained m a substantial amount of, of wealth. Right, so he had this kind of very, kind of very shrewd or lucky or both a path, because already at the time, as you know, Byzantine politics was somehow um, you know, aristocratic, if not oligarchic, in nature, heavily. So, um, 
so when he arrived in Constantinople, he managed, thanks to these favors, to have himself noticed, especially thanks to his extraordinary force. Right? He was seemingly quite broad-chested. He had also kind of big eyes, kind of joining eyebrows. Um, so much the same, Michael III decided to take him uh, in his retinue as a squire, right? That uh, requires some, in fact, athletic uh, capacity. He, the guy was younger, of course, and that's also why Michael would eventually think of him as uh, his um, successor later. Uh, in fact, the favor of Michael towards Basil kept growing, and in 856, um, Basil obtained an important palace office. At this point, already uh, attracting the suspicion of the Caesar Bardas, um, it, between the two, uh, a violent rivalry broke out immediately, and the outcome of which was the killing of Bardas, as we said, on April the 21st, 800. 65. And after this, Basil obtained from Michael, that still, um, you know, was was uh, was positive towards him, the crown of co-emperor, which was a way of, you know, essentially indicating, you know, that it wasn't quite a dynastic succession formally recognized as in the Byzantine institution. So this was a way to just indicate and favor, like, who, who your heir would de facto be in them coops aside that as you know in Byzantine history were rather uh, frequent exactly because of this kind of concentrated power in a, in a single um, other, what was still in a sense a centralized power like a, uh, an old fashioned state of model uh, would, was supposed to just succeed um, Right after this, however, the relation between Michael and Basil began already to deteriorate, and on September the 23rd, 867, as we have seen before, the associated emperor took out Michael III, killed in sleep by a group of plotters um, to whom uh, Basil himself uh, belonged. Um, Basil reign at that point was um, fundamentally stable. Uh, there was no major trouble, right? The uh, succession was already, uh, had partially already been ensured by his co-imperial title, etc. Um, the, you know, the, em the new emperor changed his uh, ecclesiastical policy. Effectively, he normalized the relations with the Roman papacy um, that had been set strained under Michael III. In fact, the first thing he did as he rose to the throne was to depose Fossius, that, as you know, had caused, in, before the 11th century, a significant break uh, with Rome. And we'll talk about him uh, specifically. Fossius was sent in exile at this point. And the previous patriarch of Constantinople that had been adverse to, to taken away by Michael and adverse to Fortius, Ignatius, was reintegrated uh, instead. So that was, you know, quite eloquent and clear political move. Um, it, it, Basil started at that point new contacts with, with Rome, right? It's worth noticing that. Basil was essentially the first emperor after Constantius II in the 7th century to actually resume a, a proper uh, Western policy, as, as we will see now, as many positions in Italy were consolidated, right? And that was a big deal because um, we are looking at times in which, uh, first of all, from the other side, you had the Carolingians, who was... Um, generally speaking, uh, kind of a competition, of course, for Rome that was at this point under the, the Franks, uh, just by political um, sphere, and the same popes naturally had uh, and been enjoying that. But but Rome had always been connected with Constantinople, so to that point it would remain 
for a significant amount of time as it could play kind of a decentralized policy with the with the Byzantine support. It is probably the presence in, in southern Italy that required papal support historically, right? And returning there was just showing that the empire uh, was still alive, uh, even after the, the troubles of the previous couple of centuries. Um, as you know, from the Islamic uh, invasions to the same iconoclasm that had... Uh, generally speaking, not just the, the centralized imperial rule, but also created significant opposition to it. Um, in Rome, when Pope Nicholas I died, St. Peter's throne had been occupied by Hadrian II, who had a more conciliatory attitude towards the Byzantine Empire. I mean, during the Faustian um, controversy, naturally the, the relations between Roman Constantinople had been significantly strained, as we will see now. There was a a very big game at that point that the, the papacy was playing also in Central Europe for the evangelization of other peoples, also in, 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 in the sphere, actually. Some populations had been traditionally in, this, in the sphere of Byzantine influence. It was a struggle there, so um, naturally, the, the Romans were the, the the Roman papacy was always kind of cautious regarding the 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 benefits that could come from from a from a philo Byzantine politics uh, policy, especially after the recent strains. Um, and in order to show the goodwill of of the two sides, a new council, uh, an ecumenic one on paper, better parchment at this point, uh, was held in Constantinople between 869 and 870. Um, this was granted by Hadrian II's kind of complacency. It required, in fact, kind of a, still uh, a Christian unity of some sort. So uh, it's obvious that already at this time uh, there was... a a significant divide between the Western and the Eastern Church. But Rome was the point of, of juncture, right? So this was an ecumenic council, not just like the time of late antiquity of the migration era, where in theory still the Romanity of the Empire was, was one. At this point the Carolingians had done something else, the papacy had done something else. So it was actually a Byzantine council, right, just per se. Um, it, it was uh, important just for, for the solidity, the cohesion of the empire, just to address broader matters in ecclesiastical policy, also in, in the areas that had remained somehow, as we'll see now, can even Olympus in a frontier, um, where naturally the ecclesiastical rights had to be repersonated, the imperial action was needed, um, and in fact a unity of intent was, was required. Uh, thus, uh, Fotsu's um, uh, impasse was, was surpassed in many ways. The, the former patriarch was excommunicated. Um, however, uh, not all the uh, differences with Rome could be healed, right? Um, and the main reason, of course, being the fact that uh, the Roman papacy still could boast without too much that even the, the Byzantine emperors could do regarding the primacy right, of, of charity in, uh, in the Christian world of the, of the Church of Rome and the fact of the, the most important role that Constantinople would have always had to have but was not even an apostolic capital per se, at least it had been attemptedly created as such fictitiously by, by Constantine. Um, and one uh, thorny topic in this question was also the um, like the policy of other peoples that, as we've seen, were either already Christianized but were in between kind of Roman Constantinople were yet to Christianize. Um, and so there was a problem of which one of the two churches should have fundamentally led uh, to carry out the, the evangelization directly. Uh, in fact, on this in, in this circumstance, the Bulgars sided with the Constantinopolitan Church, um, 
that formerly um, was um, carried out during the council in spite that occasion of the opposition of the Roman delegates. Uh, we have talked about the the first Bulgarian Empire, we'll keep doing it, um, but as you know, the 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 Bulgars or the actually the, the Bulgarians at this point um, caused a uh, were always aware of the, their importance. There were always this looming threat in Constantinople, and they had, generally speaking, to gain from, of course, a a Byzantinization of their church because uh, simply Constantinople was the closest civilization. The, the Bulgarian Empire had fundamentally been modeled on it. Uh, and it was just the easiest thing. Uh, the, on the other hand, uh, signing with Rome at some point had been a very interesting tool to pressure Constantinople herself, because at that point, um, creating a contrast of that kind could have damaged significantly. Uh, Constantinople could have been just an indicator that uh, an entire re that massive region, considered at this point the Magyars had not migrated in fact, in the Hungarian plain yet, so, um, you know, the Bulgarians were just connected with the Carolingian Empire, as as long as the, their territorial, um, say, control went, uh, and or, you know, this for how much they could stretch it with military uh, campaigns. Um, and uh, this was one of those cases in which the Bulgarians preferred to, prefer to, to stick with Constantinople, in a way, and to uh, probably we will see that that in in kind of in depth, like it's not um, so so significant. Now, the important thing though is that this caused problems to the same Byzantines as far as Basil's policy wanted to recount reconcile with the Roman papacy, right? And of course, some fundamental differences culturally, historically remained, and the f the function. Schism hadn't been kind of just a light thing, right? So the Roman papacy wanted some guarantees that were obviously naturally always kind of looking at a, an interference also in Byzantine affairs. And it was just always this kind of complex sense from, from Constantinople that they, they couldn't quite bring the Roman papacy under as they, as instead, uh, it would do normally with the low with the Constantinopolis and Patriarchate. Basil the first led uh, in, in all this um, a, a power policy, right? He managed to consolidate, for example, the positions in of, of Constantinople in Dalmatia, in the east, in Italy. So a great work of uh, reconquest that was energetically pursued now with significant resources that were uh, available and in a moment of crisis generally speaking of other powers around that were uh, cleverly exploited um, in Dalmatia the Byzantine authority was reaffirmed uh, towards the uh, on, on the coastal cities as it was uh, like the most um, obvious thing to do, as we'll see now from a from an imperial perspective, but also on the Slavic tribes that pr had practically become independent during the iconoclasm. Uh, also, an attempt of conquest uh, by the Arabs to seize uh, Ragusa, today's Dubrovnik, in 867 was thwarted. Um, this um, uh, this Byzantine affirmation in Dalmatia was uh, was quite meaningful because the revived imperial presence was eventually uh, sanctioned through the establishment of a theme of Dalmatia, uh, and the the Adriatic had become particularly important to um, the Western policy naturally because that was a frontier area between some centers that had historically remained uh, in, in, say, if not in Byzantine direct control, at least within the orbit of the empire. Think about Venice, right? There was much in Dalmatia that we've seen also as far as the Duchy of Croatia 
in the video about it uh, was concerned because it was a way to reactivate first of all the naval power of Constantinople over uh, a coastal area of great strategic significance Dalmatia is all as you know dotted with uh, gulfs uh, islets um, you know it's um, it's a perfect Ragusa in fact is the most important center strategically speaking it has a hell of a port so Byzantine civilization as you know had always thrived coastally right there were some areas we consider Byzantine in, of the interland but were just kind of under it in a in a political sense but were culturally socially and, and more very different from the core of what was truly like a, a really Greek uh, background it's as if you know the the the, the Hellenic telesocracy the, the just the coastal colonization had survived through, throughout the uh, the millennia um, as a as a culture on its own it's where mostly Constantinople operated from especially as far as the West was concerned because in Asia Minor of course it was a significant continental dimension as well that was also significantly different but it had brought at least to the installment of some kind of uh, um, say aristocracies that also mixed with the locals I mean the same Armenian origin of, of Basil may have had to do with that at least was not really an aristocratic one but still the idea that there were some peoples like the Armenians that had been just integrated in the empire and that they had been provided with land with uh, command posts and on the eastern frontier etc et is, uh, is significant. Uh, this was less true in the West, where there was um, actually a much greater maritime potential. Ragusa, as you know, would become an important maritime republic. Um, and Venice as well. So, uh, the um, let's say, the, the naval control, as far as the connection of those areas, where the, there was a Carolingian Empire in difficulty and struggling, especially on the Dalmatian coast, against the, the local Slavs that at this point were preferably to feel under the Byzantines than the Franks, that they were the most pressuring element there, both from the Adriatic watershed and the Danubian one in the interland, um, really played to the favor of Constantinople. They could simply arrive, say, okay, we occupy these coastal centers, we just don't care so much about the interland, because at the end of the day, we will simply control these ports of it from the, uh, the Balkan mountains, um, communities, and that's what we're content with. This was true also in the Aegean Sea, right, in the Black Sea, etc. Um, and it's significant that the Empire could reaffirm its presence at this point militarily, navally, uh, also to show the Slavic tribes of the interland that were gradually Christianizing and kind of from that, say, in the immediate interland of Dalmatia, were however, to fall under the, the Byzantine orbit historically, to, of course, represent properly a provincial uh, control territorially, demographically, over such um, polities that had exploited, as we've seen, the iconoclasm, especially to say, okay, well, this is a mess. As we made multiple videos about the iconoclasm. We know what happened at the time. Essentially, there was a great... Um, uh, confiscation of, of uh, an incredible amount of land and property by by the Byzantine state on, of this um, in this in fact monastic centers that had attracted most of properly the agricultural interland as far as the populations were concerned, becoming uh, overbearingly powerful in a also kind of centrifugal decentralized way. Um, sometimes it was just plain looting. Right, there wasn't anything, you know, sophisticated politically speaking about that. Um, uh, in in these other kind of um, kind of more difficult areas, such as the Balkan interland, uh, it was also a matter, of, however, reaffirming a the 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 presence of uh, the Byzantines on a frontier area that was becoming significantly. Uh, you know, uh, at least it presented an opportunity as far as the the Franks and the Bulgarians um, countering was uh, was concerned, right? Especially the the, the anti-Carolingian function. Um, the fact that uh, the Arabs that at this point were 
essentially expanding during the Saracen era, etc., and and um, and uh, that they could be, say, pushed away, uh, swept away by by the Byzantine navy that was adequate at least against that kind of piracy. Not always; there were ferocious struggles, and, and as we've seen also under Leo VI, we made a video about Byzantine naval warfare. That there wasn't really like that enormous kind of classocratic or naval su superiority of, of, the, of the Byzantines um, it, at, at this point, right? Uh, the, 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 the function of fleets was pretty much similar to the, all the other kind of states, uh, right, territorial states existing at that time. Of course, it required, in fact, such concentrated power, but the Byzantines didn't score a radical naval victories in a consistent way to, to claim kind of a some kind of top standard that could not be reached by the others where right? it was mostly they were also mostly secondary operations and especially piracy was to be countered mostly through garrisoning uh there were ships around but say not the entire imperial fleet against but it was important for the population of the, of the interland to recognize that that was a coastal stability to make uh, trade work smoothly um, and such things. Success against the Arabs was also scored by the Imperial Army in the East. This had been the, um, the hottest frontier of Constantinople up to this point since the Islamic invasions. Um, it was different in some ways, it was of course distant from the capital, but the uh, lines of Asia Minor were, were significant enough, especially for their the possibility of invading Syria and the Euphrates Valley. Um, the latter of which, in fact, saw the Byzantine recovery of some strongholds, right, to allow further uh, incursions in the in Mesopotamia. Um, naturally, the the, the western mo you go and, and the um, say the more Byzantine the entire world looked like there and the, the eastern was kind of more of a frontier an in-depth one with lots of castles also kind of tough nature if you know the orography of it the climate um, it, this area would not be lost by the empire until massacred 200 years later right and at this point uh, such Byzantine military success it would also continue um, during the, the Macedonian dynasty showed how consistent the control of the area still was and or at least however it was not significantly threatened or at least to the scale it would come to be um, in, in Seljuk times. In the east significantly however the Byzantines had also to fight against the Paulicians right this heretical sect um, the uh, doctrine of which was strongly hostile to every constituted order and it had spread dangerously in Asia Minor right these were essentially agnostics they were in part also the uh, probably the precursors of the Bogomils of the Cathars was in the West um, Asia Minor since uh, the settlement of the Galatians and probably some kind of, um, you know, dualistic, in fact, cults had remained um, significantly heterodox historically since, uh, you know, the early Roman Empire and um, in some isolated communities of the interland it, it had been consolidating, like as a sort even of kind of not national identity, however, something that had characterized the uh, autonomistic tendencies of the empire, but taking on more radical um, uh, tones, right? In fact, typical of Gnostic, um, of the Gnostic heresies. And as you know, the, the, the Byzantines later against the Bogomils and the spread in the Balkans would, um, would arrive to carry out a crusade themselves, which was the only one they ever did, because otherwise the concept was practically... Uh, unknown to them, so it tells you how, uh, you know, um, harassing this presence was, because it spread mostly 
and this was typical in those mountainous areas also um, from an Islamic perspective, like the center of orthodoxy was civilization, was Mesopotamia, was Baghdad, etc. Whereas the peripheral areas, the frontier mountainous ones had always hosted kind of more fanatic radicals that had been um, outcasted by the uh, the, the the orthodox establishment in the case the the Sunni the Sunni government and uh, there 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 is really a lot going on there we've seen it also in uh, during the time of the iconoclasm how say um, also composite these communities really were like in terms of um, ethnic or spiritual background and we'll talk about them a kind of bit more more in depth. In any case, we're an anti-power ideology, as always, right? It's a sort of uh, radical take on the, essentially, the negativity of any earthly uh, reality, just to deny entirely, even the, in fact, the uh, the human nature of Christ. Um, thus, the denying the impossibility of um, salvation through uh, through the transfigurational capacity. Right, that is inherent in the uh, connubium of the, uh, say, the spirit, uh, the soul, and, and the flesh. So, uh, it was something severely anti-ecumenic, anti-ecclesiastical as a consequence. I mean, the entire uh, uh, Christian empire was denied in its essential uh, nature. It was seen as flipped, according to what uh, this, this heresy is. So the um let's say the 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 bible life um naturally a difference between the old testament and new testament we will we'll look at this uh, on another occasion the, the point is just realizing that this community existed and that it was making that the eastern frontier a bit more uh unstable than it, than it could have been also undermining thus the, the efforts of further expansion in that area. However, as we've seen in this sector, the Byzantines managed to still show they were the stronger side, at least in, in, in those, again, in the areas that they managed to expand uh, against the Arabs. Um, now, in, in southern Italy, finally, was enacted a wide reconquest operation. Right After this long period of eclipse, um, and namely to uh, to to contrast the Islamic expansion as the Saracens had installed themselves um, in uh, in Sicily and as we'll see also in part of Peninsular Italy. Um, so the political geography of southern Italy had been modified during the eighth century, essentially relegating. Uh, the Byzantines in a marginal position. Essentially, the uh, uh, at the moment of the fall of the uh, Ravenate Exarchate, that as you know, fundamentally was the, the Byzantine, the center of the Byzantine government in in the in the peninsula. The already Byzantine territories of Apulia, Lucania, and Calabria had ended up uh, almost entirely under the Longbird Duchy of Benevent, right, that eventually would have developed uh, into a, a principality, especially after the the Frankish conquest of the Longbird Kingdom uh, in the north, and so uh, these Longbirds um, felt a bit like the uh, the true heirs of, you know, at least the, the collectors of the Longbird of the entire Longbird legacy. Thus, the surviving Byzantine territories had been grouped in the so-called theme of Sicily. Um, because Sicily was essentially the most important province that had remained in the hands of the Byzantine. Uh, and the theme of Sicily included, besides the island, also the Duchy of Calabria that stretched from the Strait of Messina to the Crati Valley and uh, uh, Amante in the south of Cosenza, the Duchy of Otranto, so the one essentially guarding the uh, the Otranto Strait with uh, with the Balkans, was very 
you know, important strategically, as you understand, with Otranto and Gallipoli, and the Dutch of, of uh, Naples, that included also the cities of Sorrento, Amalfi, and Gaeta. These were all very, uh, the, the latter, like the, the Neapolitan um, uh, cities were uh, all precocious maritime republics, right? And this is the reason why the Neapolitan duchy emancipated itself from the Byzantines shortly afterwards, 830. Uh, and the cities that uh, made it up um, had uh, an autonomous development also one from the other, right? It would all grow, um, they remained within, say, Byzantine in culture, in a way, and or, you know, something uh, Italo-Byzantine, we can say. Naturally, uh, these are cities that, in spite of the formalities, were, um, were, uh, had always been somehow different culture. Like, Italy had significantly decentralized during the time of the Islamic invasions for Constantinople to be reached significantly. And it's exactly in this context, actually, the of Saracen piracy, and uh, this is essentially the, the moment of apex of uh, the, say, the golden age of Islam, right? So the trade balance is in favor of the Muslims, and, and this um, Italian maritime uh, cities uh, begin to grow within that. I mean, they even minted kind of fake Taris. They, they wanted to enter the circuit, and they began to develop a, you know, a massive... Uh, naval, um, not just autonomy, but also culture, right, as far as also the, the fleets, the name, um, and this is an overlooked aspect. Um, in any case, these um, centers were also autonomous from one another, so they would often, often conflict, right, we have made a video, for example, the other day about um, the opposition to Yug of Italy, we're talking about the 10th century, but we're more or less within the same dynamics because, uh, you know, when the Saracens were crushed at the mouth of the Garigliano River, uh, dislodging them effectively from, you know, the, that base in, in, in central Italy. Uh, say, Gaeta sided with the, with the Muslims, while uh, Amalfi was part of the broader alliance. They were all Christian powers, of course, but uh, there would be a lot more to say about that. I discussed those uh, things mostly in the videos but in of um, say of the, of the Saracen era, right? If you go in the medieval Islam playlist, you, you find them. But partly in the videos about the southern longbirds, but I will have to, you know, to discuss this stuff uh, better in the future because it it's really an overlooked aspect and explains also a lot of how. The Byzantines managed to recover power in southern Italy at some point, and also to lose it again before the Norman, even before the Norman arrival. Right, so um, those are the floatings that uh, one must also chronologically fix to understand the, the Byzantine reconquests of, of southern Italy. Um, so, as I've made a video last year about this, a series about medieval Sicily, you've seen there is the one about uh, the, the Islamic rule. So the Arabs, as you know, uh, at least, you know, the kind of Berbers with Arab besides the elites settled in, in Sicily that uh, was technically Byzantine at that point. So um, it was very decentralized, but there were still local kind of imperial garrisons that held out until the beginning of the 10th century. In fact, uh, this is the point that the Arabs uh, that had not yet to had not yet finished to conquer Sicily swarmed also in peninsular Italy, both with actions of piracy, such as you know some of the most clamorous one was was the sack of the Basilica of Saint Peter and one of Saint Paul, by the way, in Rome in 846 that triggered the uh, construction of the Leonine walls and the Carolingian times. So it's an important moment. And also uh, settling stably in some areas of southern Italy, right? The Saracens settled mostly like uh, with um, fortified camps, right? They weren't really, you know, demographic colonies, a bit like the Vikings, right, in a sense. 
um, except the Vikings settled in much more sparsely populated areas in, in Northern Europe, essentially having a, an ethnic impact. The Saracens were never practically capable of, um, you know, controlling the interland significantly. They cared about this uh, trade net, this uh, kind of basis for piratic activity. Naturally, there is a lot of should understand who the Saracens were, because many Saracens we wouldn't be surprised to know that they were Christians, actually. Uh, and they were often the same Italians in this area, and, or if we talk about the, the Aegean, the, the, the Levant, they were Greeks, right? So they often engaged also in anti-Byzantine piracy uh, in that regard. And um, exactly because of this coastal interest, they tended to settle, as we've seen, they tried to coop in, in Ragusa. Um, in southern Italy, they settled in Taranto, on the Apulian coastline. It has a, as you know, it's a terrific naval base. It has basically two seas within uh, itself, so it's a hell of a position. And they managed to occupy Bari on the Adriatic Sea uh, from the other side, of, of Apulia in 841. Um, in these two areas came the target of, uh, let's say, there was a competition, let's put it in this way, between the Byzantines and the Franks for reconquering it, right? It, it's worth noticing that both, um, I think, Taranto and surely Bari were emirates, right? The caliphs had recognized to these bands of adventurers some kind of political legitimacy to, say, you know, extend their uh, their their control charismatically also in these areas um, that were infested from there with piracy, right? Especially from Apulia, the, the the Saracens threatened the Adriatic. So, as we've seen, the same portal cities of Dalmatia, where Basil had restored a significant uh, Byzantine control, exactly also in function of you know, the, the defense against the Islamic piracy. Um, thus, what happened is that Basil allied himself with the Carolingian emperor Louis II, that was uh, king of Italy, as um, the imperial title belonged at that po point to the Italic kingdom. This is after the partitions of, uh, you know, 843 of Verdun. And the the main Carolingian line ruled uh, the empire from from Pavia, from the former Longobard capital. And there is this very interesting military campaign that we will see um, at some point, likely, because there are interesting Frankish capitularies documenting it and so on. That still showed also that by 871, when it managed to reconquer. Bari back from the Saracens, you know, the, the 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 Carolingian army in Italy was still importantly functional. Um, there was a broader competition, as we've seen, between these allies because southern Italy, as we've seen, was pretty pretty much of a frontier. The, the Franks had never managed to fully recover the southern Longobard duchies that played as clients uh, first of the Franks, then of the Byzantines. And as we've seen, given that Basil was trying to recover southern Italy, that situation was, was important. What kind of armies could manage to recover Bari or Taranto first, right? Um, in fact, the Frankish con reconquest of Bari, that was also, uh, let's stress this, a, a Byzantine, a Greek city, right? Uh, these were, uh, as we were seeing before, le le on a coastal dimension, the interland was different. Or it was italic, but cities like Bari or, or Taranto were historically and significantly, first of all, Hellenic colonies back in the day. Of course, they, they had not remained uh, just in the same f fully Greek sense that we intend now, but they, they were definitely the prototypical Byzantine coastal center. So the fact that the Carolingians could occupy Bari was, was like, wow, they're stepping to a... Byzantinity, uh, like like hell, uh, and this broke, in fact, to the uh, the the break of the alliance between the Franks and the Byzantines. That, as we've seen, also kind of hated each other in principle with Venice, uh, 
where, as you know, the son of Charlemagne had died of malaria during the siege, and or because of this, um, those southern Slavic tribes um, um, on the Drina and the Sava and the same Croatians that you know now were hammered from from the from the Friulan dukes and sponsored by the Byzantines. So it was a great. It was like a cold war of some sort. Sometimes not even so cold, by the way. Um, and uh, this break, by the way, went to the advantage of Constantinople because um, the Carolingian world was entering, as you know, a, a deep crisis, as we've seen very often, especially you know concerning the so-called post-Carolingian times. Right, the dynasty had just you know not even two decades of life and much less of effective government. Um, while the Byzantine Empire didn't undergo that crisis, right? Also, the second invaders were much more kind of, were targeting definitely the most Western Europe as such. Uh, in 876, uh, in fact, uh, this brought uh, Bari to come back under Byzantine control. Right, because the local inhabitants had uh, sought the help of the governor, the Byzantine government of Otranto, um, that, as we've seen, had remained in Byzantine control against the threat of a possible Saracen com- comeback. So naturally, when the Franks had occupied Bari, they, they hadn't managed to secure like a permanent control of the city because it was too far south. From from the say the boundaries of the Italic Kingdom, it was the same Italic. Uh, uh, in fact, unity was starting to 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 vanish as well after Louis the Second was the last effect of king practically. Um, and the occupation of this city that would eventually be elected to the capital of the Byzantine governor uh, governorate, which tells you how important it was. You know, also from a Byzantine perspective, marks, in fact, the beginning of the reconquest of the territories of Apulia, uh, Lucania, and Calabria by the Byzantines. That, in fact, for 200 years, essentially, would have uh, remained in control um, of such uh, lands, right, uh, before the Normans arrived. In 880, a Byzantine army coming from uh, the European themes, so of the Balkans, uh, landed in Italy and uh, uh, and seized Taranto as well. Right, so they the Byzantines managed to strip that port from the Saracens as well. This victory was consolidated in the following years uh, by hand of the um, Strategos Nikephoros Falcus that would recur like in later history as you know um, with uh, you know becoming emperor himself and as one of the most successful generals in, in Byzantine history in fact with the capture already at this point the curriculum spoke by itself of all the Calabrian strongholds controlled by the Arabs right it was a very methodic procedure uh, with you know, Byzantine amphibious operations, sieges, the, Calabri- the Calabrian coast is quite ragged, the, the, the settlements were very, you know, uh, well fortified, but Byzantine logistics, polar aesthetics, and mostly this command strategy organization by Nikephoros really um, expressed the, the best of, of Byzantine military culture there. This allowed essentially the Calabrian cities to be connected to the Apulian dominions, um, conferring naturally uh, a much greater depth of imperial influence in these lands, both by sea and by land, in fact. Um, and so, recompacting properly southern Italy in a politically and territorially contiguous way, uh, like it it hadn't been the case for from a long time. Right? At this point, the the Longbird power also far in the south. Uh, the the Longbirds had arrived down to Calabria, right in the plain of Rossano, those areas, uh, but had remained essentially a continental power 
like mostly that they were entrenched in the Apennines, they controlled mostly just the, the interland, right? And again, the Byzantines were stronger at sea, so there was not really a match there. And the Imperial Army was quite strong also on land. Um, we will, again, I made a video about the Southern Longbergs, and you can partly look at this dynamics also in those other videos. Um, as far as uh, a more international political game, there is the competition that we remember before uh, between Rome and Constantinople, and so between also the Carolingian Empire, what remained of it, at least, you know, the Western Christendom and Constantinople. Uh, as far as, in fact, Central Europe was concerned, right? Michael III had already given a significant impulse um, to this, realizing that many populations settled in the in the Balkans, but also in Central Europe, were opening to, to Christianization, had a lot to gain, especially their elites, for the compaction of more stable, subtle realities evolving from the tribal ones, um, and Rome was aware of that too, right? The same Carolingian conquests had fundamentally brought to the, uh, to the compaction and, and the Christianization of all Germany, right? The conquest of Saxony with the further expansion of the frontier uh, in the east. So actually the foundation of new dioceses, etc., uh, in as a staple ecclesiastical administration of some were destroyed, Hamburg was destroyed by the Viking as a point, um, but were fundamentally there to stay, right? And so uh, lots of things would actually occur. Uh, in, in, in the meanwhile, considered that at this point the Magyars hadn't, again, as I said before, yet migrated, like formed this wedge between the Bulgarians and the Franks. So there, there had been a moment, as you know, of expansion of Moravia. Uh, uh, the latter being, in fact, at this point, the main objective of the same, um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, missions, right, of evangelization that were still actually concerted with Rome, right? Cyrillus and Methodius actually moved from Rome and appoint some of the um, the early, uh, you know, uh, an official kind of relation with these peoples uh, occurred, in fact, in the in the Eternal City rather than Constantinople. Um, however, you know, in order to, of course, to to Christianize these peoples, you needed to give them something more, right? Um, and especially in, in a political sense, and it was difficult for both sides because the Byzantines could could not and would not expand in 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 the north, right? It was just, there was no point in doing that. There were much more developed uh, areas to conquer all around, as we have just seen. Um, and just in between, you had there Bulgaria, and then just, you would have to enter in central. It was unfeasible in many ways. Um, the Carolingian Empire was collapsing. So also Rome and uh, whoever was the emperor, in a, at least it could be, right, uh, even the, the, the kings later, before the advent of Otto the I, um, could hardly manage this um, Christianizing process in a unitary way, so that, as you know, the full Christianization of these areas, at least in a more uh, solid fashion, would, would occur basically at the end of the 10th century, that it was a long process, right? Uh, but it was important to define at least which spheres of influence would have been the, you know, uh, say, uh, bought by by these uh, uh, communities. I made a video about this, uh, specifically about Moravia, the Rus, Saint Bulgaria. Like there was a lot of, you know, uh, kind of uh, active role played by the same people. So they weren't just the good savages who were simply Christianized by the, the civilizer. They they knew very well what was happening all around and they exploited this moment of uh, weakness um, of the of civilization during the end of the ninth and the first half of the tenth centuries to have a saying in the process also to consolidate their own power accordingly and to play with Christianity also internally, right? Um, the 
Byzantines essentially lost the predominion in Moravia. Uh, there was a time in which, because of, of local struggles, some Byzantine churches that we can also, uh, you know, observe archaeologically were destroyed. Um, because, of course, there was naturally always a party that opposed Christianization and or specifically that specific ruler that wanted Christianization, that when, if they were the rulers, they would do the same. But especially the Roman papal, and so the, also the Frankish church, essentially extended a control there, considered that the Eastern Frankish kingdom bordered Moravia and Bohemia. So those were areas that, as you know, would uh, remain uh, Christian. There was um, in the, in Roman uh, Christians uh, for good. Also, Hungary in the south, here, Moravia had, exp you know, had had a significant component also in the, the Principality of Nisra. We will have to make videos about that further in the south. It would be essentially occupied by the Magyars. Um, so, uh, this, this, the limits of the Byzantine uh, evangelization struggles are even at when you realize that they fundamentally succeeded in, in, in the Balkans and in Eastern Europe. But as far as Central Europe, it was to become kind of the the more advanced area of all these. Later on, uh, the Roman papacy, and with, with a lot of, actually also of uh, brutal force, because not much because of, of Christianization, but also for literally making them understand and develop themselves by, by osmosis as a civilization. I mean, Poland, Bohemia, all evolved with a deep sense of, uh, like Hungary also in the end, of, in a sense, the superiority of uh, the Frankish civilization. Um, and um, let's say, as, at least uh, considering that we're just bordering uh, what would become the Holy Roman Empire, um, it was obvious for the papacy just to just to, to, to entertain with them kind of greater relations since since the beginning. Uh, the disciples of Methodius had been expelled from Moravia already, so it had been um, a Roman victory with the substitution of fact of of these uh, missionaries with with papal ones. Um and um there was um However, coming back of those exiles, the pupils of Methodius, because as we've seen also in other videos, once they uh, left Moravia, uh, carried out a successful missionary work in the Balkans, bringing uh, within the orbit of the Church of Constantinople, importantly enough, the Serbs, and the other Slavic tribes settled in the region. This would give origin to a significant divide culturally. Think about the Croats that were Roman Catholic and the Serbs um, would become Orthodox in this way. So um, these were originally kind of very similar people so with very um, loose political distinction. And yet these two spheres of influence were to determine much of this country's histories and uh, ethnic uh, divide. And the Serbs were, um, as you know, dwelling essentially from the right si side of the Danube, um, in the, uh, you know, in, in quite mountainous areas. They had been exposed fundamentally to these old nomadic steppes movements that tend to settle, in fact, north in the uh, in the plains, and that. Um, significantly would uh, bring the, the Serbs to just to stick to Constantinople because it was the safest haven, right? They, by developing very autonomously and also in areas that the Byzantines could barely control practically the, in a direct uh, fashion. Um, but the situation was still loose. We'll ha still have to make a video about the early Serbian principalities because it's a very interesting history. Basil the first um, furthermore changed the ecclesiastical policy undertaken at the beginning of his reign. Um, uh, we're talking about the relations with Rome because these um, the results had been disappointing in, 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 in uh, ex post. Um, and in 875, he went as far as recalling Fossius from the exile, 
to Constantinople, um, entrusting him the education of his children. Interestingly enough, um, Alexander and Leo, and at the death of Ignatius um, in 877, the Fotius was again brought on the patriarchal throne of Constantinople. Um, meaning that probably those failures in, in Moravia and the general contrast with Rome had rendered it kind of useless now to try a specific cooperation. Actually, it was much more behind this in the Roman relations. We will have to see it. Uh, but that was an important factor. Um, and, in fact, Rome... In, when Fotius was elected, also recognized him as a patriarch. And this happened under John VIII. It was quite a political pope. We'll have to, again, to look at that phase of Roman history because it's really violent and it's really kind of famous. Uh, in many ways, this would have been allegedly, if I'm not wrong, the popus, but of course it's bullshit. It never happened where right? he was a man. Uh, people just misinterpret the sources for writing novels, not you know because there was any shady mystery behind that. Um, but there is also way more than that. Um, and this Roman support came uh, basically also through the uh, revocation of the condemnation pronounced against Fotius back in the day with a new synod in 879, at the presence of Papa Legate, uh, this is, of course, was always the, uh, of course, they, they, there was a, probably a principle of ecumenism that had always brought the Papa Legates in, kind of, at least usually in the Byzantine synods, etc. There was really a lot here. For example, we know that even in Arab Sicily there were some, uh, of course, uh, communities of Greek monks that um, that survived in a way or not. I mean, sometimes were harassed by the Muslims, sometimes tolerated. They lived in the mountains like hermits. And we know, so we know very few about what happened to those Christian communities during Islamic times, but they, they existed. And we you find these Sicilians in the, this in fact imperial, um, like Sardinians, I mean, people that in theory had remained not completely cut out from, from the Byzantines, or at least had been somehow controlled by, uh, by the Arabs most, participating to, in fact, Byzantine held councils of some sort. And, and it, I mean, the councils, of course, looked at all the problems of mostly ecclesiastical administration, the church possessions there. So you understand that there was something going on, and unfortunately, Islamic historiography is not so insightful like the Christian one. Like, we literally have too few. The, like, if you read the Latin Germanic story, this is true also for the Byzantines, right? The Byzantines didn't write so much for us to understand. It was a much more sclerotic, oligarchic kind of uh, world than, uh, than the West, right? Even in the collapse of Carolingian times, we've seen it in the video about the monasteries as a uh, connective fabric of post Carolingian Europe, um, there was, um, like, Western historiography was dramatically florid, insightful, uh, detailed, right? It, even in the darkest times, they, there was, we know something substantial, right? Uh, in some, for some areas, we really don't, and that should obviously uh, make us wonder how and why this happened. Of course, if you if you realize, for example, the nature of Byzantine power we described before, and you um, realize why, for example, what was happening in, in the interland, aside from those coastal centers, was relatively, and even in those sometimes, like, not so interesting. Not, no, that Everything revolved around the court of Constantinople. Right? That is not to say there was nothing outside of that, of course. But... Uh, what was there was less likely to be documented because the place of power was well another, right? So a lot of, of really lots of stuff. First of all, uh, to consider, but lots of different fields. Sometimes I quote certain 
certain videos, like the one about Russia's love of Moravia. Um, the, 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 the one about Kiev. The, the, really, I discussed, if you go in the Byzantine history playlist, um, there's really a lot about that, so you can easily find all these various um, kind of overlapping realities from the, the evangelization of Christian Europe, the Byzantine reconquest, the Carolingian made a video about Carolingian Italy, I made a video about the, the Dutch of Croatia, I talk about the origins of the Ser Serbs, and we'll have just to go, I think, next. I have to finish the the second part of Medieval Parma, and then I think I will pass to Medieval Ragusa, as far as Dubrovnik um, is, uh, is, is concerned, because that's... Um, you know, those are all pieces of Europe that you must learn about, otherwise you will not understand the context, right? And so, um, naturally, I do what I can, time allowing. Nobody knows what happens tomorrow in many ways, but um, uh, the the point being, naturally, um, that I, I will hopefully go on uh, with this content. For today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.